another uh, reform during this period was the reform for women's rights, women getting more rights. People like Lucretia Mott, who led a convention in uh, New York, Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. It's a huge movement, one of the mo most momentous movements in uh, women's rights issues in American history, Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was there and she was the, one of the main speakers at the Seneca Falls Convention. And she advocated suffrage for women. And 18, this is 1848. Now you're talking about 70 more years until women, 72 more years before women actually get the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony was uh, also at the Seneca Falls Convention, a big advocate for women's rights. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who became the first female graduate of a medical college. Uh, the Grimke sisters, who we'll talk about in the next chapter, who uh, were actually Southerners who moved north because of their um, uh, championing, champion, championing uh, of the uh, abolitionist movement. Uh, Seneca Falls Convention started out with uh, a speech by Elizabeth Cady Stanton where she uh, read what they called the Declaration of Sentiments. And it starts out with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. She added women to that phrase. Uh, that phrase comes from the Declaration of Independence, and, uh, but it doesn't say women. So she added that and her Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, more than 300 women attended the Seneca Falls Convention, and even men like Frederick Douglass and uh, uh, William Lloyd Garrison were also uh, members of, the, uh, of, or were also uh, attendants of the Seneca Falls Convention. The movement for abolition and women's rights movement movements oftentimes went hand in hand. Um, they teamed up together. Uh, to prove their point. Women were fighting for rights, African Americans were fighting for rights. So abolitionists and women's rights advocates, advocates formed a bit of an alliance. All right, the next uh, thing we're gonna talk about are uh, utopian societies in the reform period. There are people who decided to live harmoniously together, um, communistically, that's why they're called communes. It was a strange, strange movement. I oftentimes will relate it to um, the cults of the 1960s. I'm not saying that these were cults, but some of them were cult-ish. So one group, uh, interesting group, was in New Harmony, Indiana, started by a man by the name of Robert Owen. And he established this communistic colony um, there where people who uh, were scientists and writers teamed up and uh, sold all their worldly possessions, pulled all their money together and said, we're gonna start farming. And whatever we produce, we're going to sell. And that's how we're going to make it in life. And they thought it would be an ideal situation where scientists and writers and educators would live together. But as you could probably guess, dissension arose. And in 1828, the community ceased to exist. And they, uh, um, people had to go their own way. Um, and uh, it didn't work out. Another, uh, uh, this is a more successful utopian society it was called the brook farm society and it was a, a group of people who called themselves transcendentalists a transcendentalist was someone who believed in intuition it wasn't a religion but it kind of was a religion hard to really explain it hard to put your finger on it but uh it was it was uh 18 it was 1841 to 1847 in massachusetts and well-known authors like Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Margaret Fuller, Horace Greeley. They're people that are known in history were members of this George uh, Ripley started uh, utopian society. George Ripley was a Unitarian minister. So there is a religious element of it, but just Unitarians tended not to be super religious. Um, so it was, it was strange. It was definitely different. You want to talk about strange and different. Uh, the Oneida community was a utopian community that produced flatware like dishes and baskets and, you know, forks and knives and spoons. Um, actually, they're still around today. Now, their communistic uh, utopian practices are not still around because they're, frankly, kind of creepy. Uh, it was one big, how do I say it, um, 
complex marriage. Everybody kind of living in and amongst each other and a bunch of kids running around that they didn't really know who their daddy was. So if someone would ask them, who's your daddy? They may not know. Uh, it was started by a man, the name of John Noyes, and it was a complex, big marriage. Everybody is, you know, married to each other. Strange. Once again, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, there's this Oneida is still around today. If you, you may even find that you have it in your cabinet in your kitchen. If you look at a plate and look underneath the bottom of the plate and see who, what the manufacturer of the plate is, it might be Oneida. So yeah, but, uh, there are sexual practices and things like that. Um, you know, obviously still, they're not like that anymore. Another group, interesting group were the shakers, um, who, uh, were kind of an offshoot of the Quakers and they were taught to shake at the word of, at the word of God. And they, um, didn't believe in any sex at all. So they were <laughs> celibate. They were strict believers in celibacy and to become a shaker, you had to be converted to a shaker because obviously shakers aren't having kids. Strange time. And then the book talks about certain people that, that you should be familiar with like Asa Gray and, and uh, um, botany. He's a botany um, uh, professor. Uh, people like John Audubon, who um, wrote, wrote, uh, drew pictures of birds, and he was a big uh, bird watcher. So his paintings could be found all over the internet now. Uh, others, you know, they're just talking about some of the social aspects of the uh, reform period. Architecture became big, and one of the um, country country's best architects was Thomas Jefferson, who uh, had who was a believer in the French architecture. And you could see on the left Monticello, and the right University of Virginia, very French-like uh, painters like Gilbert Stuart. There's some of his paintings, portraits of Washington his wife, Martha, and Thomas Jefferson, are also Charles Wilson Peale. Some of his paintings, you'll find some of them in my classroom. The daguerreotype was invented during this time uh, in 1837, the first ever pictures. This is the first picture ever taken. And the daguerreotype was a piece of glass dipped in silver nitrate and then a, with a flash in a box. And the picture would be, the, the, the scene would be reflected back and then you take the piece of glass out of the silver nitrate and voila, you have the first ever pictures. It's about 15 years later is when um, the Eastman Kodak comes out with the actual camera. But daguerreotypes were the, some of the early pictures that you're gonna see in history were actually daguerreotypes. A lot of literary accomplishments, people like uh, Washington Irving writing things like that you might've heard of, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Winkle, James Fenimore Cooper, uh, the Last of the Mohicans, pretty good movie if you ever want to watch something like that. Uh, and then this movement during th this time period that I oftentimes also relate to the 60s, very, very 60s-ish. Uh, peace and love and uh, God is imminent in each person and in nature. And, uh, you know, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, wrote an essay called Nature. Uh, Henry David Thoreau wrote a book called Walden. About life living on a pond on a pond the banks of a pond and he just would literally sit there all day and do nothing and reflect so very um very meditation like um very unitarian very you know follow your inner light if you believe something is wrong then possibly it probably is wrong um even if the law says it's not and an example would be slavery back then uh People like Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson hated slavery and were really resentful against a government that would allow slavery. And, uh, you know, he said just because slavery is legal doesn't mean it's right. And he would urge them to protest. Uh, so not surprising, uh, people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King were followers of transcendentalists. Uh, and this, they, they strongly believe in... Um, you know, following that inner light, which is intuition. Henry David Thoreau's Resistance to Civil Disobedience was read by Gandhi and read by Martin Luther King. And some, some of the things that they did um, were ideas that were in that book by Henry David Thoreau. So follow your inner light or follow your intuition. If you've ever been in a situation, and maybe you haven't because you're young, where you just know something isn't right, you can't pinpoint exactly why, but you know something is uh, right or wrong. 
uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, another one, uh, and Henry David Thoreau are the two that we've just been talking about, some of the things that they did. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, also a uh, um, transcendentalist, wrote uh, things like Evangeline and the uh, Song of Hiawatha and the Courtship of Miles Standish. Other literary giants at this time, people like Louisa May Alcott and Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote The Raven. The Baltimore Ravens are named after that. that uh, Poe is actually from Baltimore. Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. Uh, there you go, Baltimore Ravens. And that concludes chapter 15.